Well, good evening. It's good to be here this evening. If you think I'm a little overdressed for the occasion, I got this as a birthday gift for my last birthday, and there's never a chance to ever wear it. <laughs> so I just decided I'm going to wear it tonight. So indulge me. Well, let's bow, look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that he came to save his people from their sins. We are sinners, and we need him. And we thank you for this time to reflect on that, this season to reflect on it. We pray you would use it to stimulate us to love and good deeds, to mo move us to love him more deeply. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight is Maundy Thursday, as Mitch said. That is a funny word, isn't it? Maundy. We usually say that very often. It comes from the Latin word mandatum. There's a nice Italian feel to it, right? It means commandment. It refers to the new commandment in John 13, 34. And Thursday is the traditional day that was assigned to the Last Supper and to Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper before his crucifixion on Good Friday during Passover. Hence, Maundy Thursday, the day Jesus issued the Maundy or New Commandment, and that is found uniquely in John's Gospel, which is John's rendition of the Last Supper and the time when Jesus gave the church this new order, this new commandment. You obviously know what it is to love one another, but more importantly, I'm wondering this morning, this evening, does it order your life? Does this new Monday order the way that you live? I think what we want to do is take a moment in John 13 to kind of put that commandment in its context. So if you turn with me, uh, we're going to just spend a little bit of time running up to John 13 and particularly starting in verse 31. But I want to go back because the first 20 verses record Jesus washing of the disciples' feet and it says nothing about the Last Supper in this chapter. So one of the questions is how do we know that John 13 is part of the Last Supper narrative when it doesn't explicitly say so? Well, we know because some of the details here in John 13 are repeated in the synoptic gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are generally viewed as chronologically clear and relatively accurate chronologically. Thus, we can confidently surmise that Jesus' foot washing occurred in the upper room on Maundy Thursday during the Last Supper. That's a pretty solid conclusion. But what did it mean? So let me read selectively from those first 20 verses, starting in verse 5. It says, Then he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. I'll drop down to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for, I, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, what they had not yet understood was that Jesus was about to cleanse their depraved hearts and wicked souls by the shedding of his blood. They didn't get that yet. 
They were unclear about that. His washing of their feet was really an enacted parable of love for them, for his covenant people. Remember what Jesus will say a little later that evening, that evening, greater love has no man than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. But Jesus extends this parable of love to them as an admonition for them to do the same. He says, if I washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do just as I did to you. Now this sets up the new monday, the new commandment in the next passage. Now a few verses later, still here in verses 1 to 20, Jesus acknowledges that not all are included for the devil had already inspired Judas to lift up his heel against Jesus. And in verses 21 to 30, we're not going to look at those, Judas departs immediately after Jesus says, what you do, do quickly. And with his departure, I would suggest that the new covenant apostles are now clearly identified. We need to get Judas out of there because he's not a part of the group. And at this point, I believe the scene switches. There's some debate on this, but as I see it, that the scene switches from the upper room to the Mount of Olives, particularly per the synoptic gospel accounts in Mark. Gethsemane, by the way, was located at the foot of the Mount of Olives. So we want to pick it up there in this setting. Verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, uh, yet a little while while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus begins his farewell discourse in verse 31 to the 11 disciples, the apostles who along with the New Testament prophets will become the foundation of the church. And on this Monday, Thursday, the night before Christ was crucified, he begins to prepare them for his departure with the teaching on his eminent glorification. Now that's kind of confusing language. Let me just suggest there are three things particularly worthy of note from that talk about glorification in verses 31 and 32. First, the Son of Man... That phraseology is meant to take us back to Daniel chapter 7 with its reference to Jesus, the Son of Man, ascending and receiving all authority and power. You know, it's helpful for us to not forget the one who will shed his blood, the Son of Man who will be given all authority. That's the one we're talking about. Second, the interweaving of the Son's glory with the Father's reveals a couple of things. First, I think it reveals the reality of our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. By the way, the Spirit will be mentioned five times in this farewell discourse. It's meant to reveal the reality of our triune God, but it's also meant to to reveal the intimacy of our triune God. In other words, the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son are inextricably bound. You can't separate them. You can't disentangle them. And this intimacy, this unity of the Godhead, will help explain the new commandment, especially in chapter 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. We won't go there, but he's laying that foundation. Thirdly, this glorification is to happen at once or immediately. As one commentator said, the Father and Son are glorified in the same event in his sacrifice, death, resurrection, and exaltation. And that event is to take place at once, immediately, at least as far as the redemptive timetable is concerned. All that will happen over the next few weeks, starting with the crucifixion. Now Jesus follows up this announcement of his imminent glorification with a plain statement of his departure to his disciples. He refers to them as his little 
children. They're his flock. They're his sheep. And he reminds them, as he had reminded the Pharisees back in chapter 7, that they cannot come with him. Now, by the way, that's going to launch much of what's in the farewell discourse, chapters 14 to 16, because it's a lot about comfort. And as soon as he says, you can't come with me, that causes all kinds of problems, all kinds of alarms go off in their mind. They're intimidated at the thought of his departure. We're not going to get into that tonight. But he tells them they cannot come. And with that plain announcement, Jesus begins to lay out what he will expect of them in his absence. He gives them the essence of that expectation in verse 34. What D.A. Carson calls, and I like this, the basic stipulation of the new covenant. Jesus is about to give them the basic stipulation of the new covenant. So let me reread those verses, verses 34 and 35. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now let's break that down. Let's break that down tonight. Notice first the introduction to the commandment. It's kind of like a trumpet fanfare at the Olympic Games or even some ancient Roman Colosseum event. Jesus, on the night before his death, announces, he announces a new mandi, a new commandment. But is it new? Is it really new? Is the idea of love a new biblical concept? I mean, the Old Testament people were anchored in the command to love, were they not? To love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and might. To love their neighbor as themselves. And Jesus had already said that neighbor love fulfilled the law, did he not? And was in fact the essence, the very essence of the law and the prophets. And John, the author of our gospel, said in his first epistle that love was not a new commandment. He said love is not a new commandment. Seems to be a problem. So what gives? What gives? Well, some have suggested a new standard. They're to love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Now, certainly that is the standard for the new commandment, but its newness, I think, is more seen in its relationship to the new covenant, which Christ would ratify in his death, burial, and resurrection. I think that's the particular nuance that Jesus is getting at. Again, I quote D.A. Carson. He says, The new covenant promised the transformation of the heart and mind. This commandment is presented as the marching order for the newly gathering messianic community. You see, with the fanfare of a new commandment, Jesus now is ready to give it to them in all of its beauty and all of its simplicity. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. There it is. Love one another. Again, not a new commandment. They've heard it many times before. But a new covenant ethos. This is what's to capture the culture of this community called the church. And it's patterned after the love of their new covenant Messiah and King. To love one another even as I have loved you. They're to love one another as Jesus loved them. But how did Jesus love them? How did he love us? As we'll hear tomorrow, he loved them by laying down his life for them. As he'll say, greater love has no man than this. He loved them by delivering himself up for them. In fact, John tells us that we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. There it is, the, the essence of love. He laid down his life for us. But I think we need another question. What does it mean that he laid down his life for us? 
I think two things. First, that he bore our sins. Now listen, that presupposes a rather difficult truth. Namely, that you and I are sinners. Specifically in Adam, we are those who have rebelled against God and his holy laws. We are those who have become outcasts from his holy presence, justly earning and meriting his eternal disfavor and banishment in a place of eternal suffering called hell. All that because of our sins, because we're sinners. So our loving king, therefore, bore the sins of his new covenant people. They were actually imputed to him in his body on the tree. You say, well, how did that happen, Wes? I don't know. But somehow it happened. Our sins, every one of them, every word, thought, deed, were imputed, were credited, were reckoned to Jesus, and he bore them in his body on the tree. That's the first thing. The second thing is that he suffered the penalty, the banishment which the sins of his people deserved. And this was epitomized in Jesus' words. Remember what he cried out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With those words, Jesus gave voice to that exile from God's holy presence, the banishment we deserved, and his physical death and burial in the grave for three days, I believe was but a physical corollary to that spiritual exile. So it's no mere physical death that marks Jesus' love for us, but a spiritual death that substitutes its own welfare reputation, comfort, pleasure, and endures the wrath of his own dear father for the sake of those who deserve nothing but utter ruination for their heinous rebellion. Jesus didn't lay down his life for lovely, worthy people. Christians are not lovely, worthy people. He died for us while we were yet filthy, fire and brimstone deserving sinners. He died to cleanse us for our sins, from our sins. God justifies the ungodly. Now I want to just say a word. There's a lot of kids here today, and by the way, you're being very well behaved. Um, kudos to your parents. But I want to say something, especially to the kids. If you could just pause from your coloring for just a minute and listen to what I have to say. You know, this is kind of no different. It's kind of no different from taking a bath in the physical realm. Why do you take a bath? Because your mother makes you. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But if you step back for just a minute and it's been three or four weeks, you would say that you, you take a bath because you're dirty. You take a shower because you're dirty. That's right. We need to be cleansed because we're dirty. And spiritually, what the Bible is saying, and the reason that Jesus had to come, is because our souls are dirty. They're filthy. They're absolutely corrupted and contaminated with sin. But the Bible says, listen to me, and there's no age requirement here. You can do this as young as you can understand what I'm saying. That if you'll confess your sins, if you'll repent of your sins, and if you'll turn to Jesus Christ in faith, he will cleanse you completely. You will be clean and acceptable before God. And so I say to you who are outside of Christ, and particularly to some of you kids, I say this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You shall be cleansed, washed, welcomed into the presence of a holy God. 
Now, the gap between lover and loved, between shepherd and sheep, that gap is immeasurable. And now he commands his people to apply the same life-giving standard to those with whom no gap exists, between fellow sheep. He calls us to sacrifice our welfare, our reputation, our goodwill, and all manner of comfort and pleasure. I like how one author puts it. He calls us to refuse to pander to our own self-interests. Don't you like the way that's said? We refuse to pander to our own self-interests for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Or as the parable of love so aptly illustrated, it's the willingness to wash one another's stinking feet as lowly servants, which indeed we are. For even the Son of Man, the great King in whose hands is all authority, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, did he? But to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And it's this love that marks the new covenant community, that causes the world to sit up and take notice, and which undergirds her mission to make disciples of all the nations. Yes, this basic stipulation of the new covenant to love one another is the most powerful apologetic for the gospel. In fact, I'd say it inversely. You want to tear down the gospel? You want to undermine its credibility? Just be a hypocrite. When regard, with regard to love. The world sees that every time, don't they? So there it is. A new mandatum. To love one another. Given to the apostles of the new covenant community on Maundy Thursday. And based on the love that would be shown to them starting the very next day. By their loving King and Messiah. You know, the hymnody of the church expresses it so well. We've already sung, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me, underneath me, all around me is the current of his love, leading onward, leading homeward, to thy glorious rest above. The song we're going to sing to close this service. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Yes, his death not only atoned for our sins, he not only became a curse for us, imagine that, and thus satisfied the righteous wrath of God the Father against us, the righteous wrath of God he satisfied. But in so doing, he gave us an example that we should also do to each other just as he did to us. That love, that example is designed when apprehended by justifying faith to break the sinner down, to crush our hard hearts. And to create a new creation, a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone that is now able to forbear petty differences. Isn't that what tends to cause problems in our relationships? Marriage. Most of those are petty differences, aren't they? They're not really principial convictions. It enables us to forbear petty differences and forgive even grievous sins. And it enables us to worship continually our great God, both with our words, 
Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Don't you just want to sing that? Worthy is the lamb that was sing. We want to join the heavenly chorus that is singing. Worthy is the lamb that is slain. But most importantly with our lives. By presenting ourselves to him. As did our loving king. As living, holy, well-pleasing sacrifices of love. For one another. This is the new commandment. It was first fulfilled by Christ, who died for our sins. Let us cast our minds, the hymnist writes, to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. As Paul exhorted us in Ephesians 5, and I close with this, let us walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice as a fragrant aroma. Yes, let us love one another. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for our great king. We thank you that he's the very definition of love. And we thank you that he has given us his power through the spirit that now dwells within us to follow his example. Oh, let us imitate Christ. Let us love one another, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.